Access Fort Wayne offers reflections of our community. Production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne are a service of the Allen County Public Library. The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily represent those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting organizations. For more information about creating your own television program with Access Fort Wayne, call 421-1250. Hello, this is Patty Hunter, and this is my show, Patty's Page. Today, I have a great friend of mine, Kristen Hawkins, who's the president of the Students for Life of America. Hello, Kristen. Hi, Patty. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I, I have you on again. Um, I understand that this Saturday, April the 20th, 2013, National Abortion Facility Action Day it's a rally. Uh, what is it really? Can you tell me more about it? Sure. It's you know, as you all know, it's the end of the school year for most of our student groups. They're getting ready for finals and uh, their last day of classes, and we wanted to have a, a last hurrah for all our pro life students to get out there with their group members to go and pray, stand peacefully in front of the abortion facility, to be there for the women who are going in, uh, and to be there for their babies. Mm -hmm. um, and so we said, you know, just get out there with a group of pro-lifers uh, one last time during the school year, and hopefully it motivates some students to stay active during the summer when they're back home in their communities that they can take a stand. We know that when young people go out in front of abortion facilities, something different happens. They Just them being there resonates with the girls who are walking in for abortions because they're the same age. Uh, and it makes, it makes the girls walking in think about, is this really my only option? Or maybe there are people who are willing to help me. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. So um, I'd like to know how and why you should answer the call to join the National Abortion Facility Action Day. I mean, how and why should we answer the call? How can we answer the call? Like, uh, well, it's answer the call by just going out. You know, you can go... Uh, there's a lot of abortion websites. I think there's a abortion.org yeah. where you can go, you can find a local abortion facility, and all you have to do is go out and be there. It doesn't take any money. It doesn't take any skill. Uh, just go out there and peaceful, peacefully pray. And we're hoping that we can inspire thousands of pro-lifers, you know, even beyond students, to go out and do this, maybe for the first time. So the, your local, unfortunately, I have to say local abortion clinics, in each state to go out there and uh, do a prayer ritual as well? That's right. And what about uh, how should one conduct themselves when they're at this abortion facility when they're doing a prayer ritual? How should people... Well, they should be out there and you should be peaceful. Um, you can calmly talk to women walking in if you have brochures or the phone number of a local pregnancy help center, uh, or just stand there and kneel and pray, uh, stand there with tape of your mouth and say, put life on the tape. You know, the, the important part is not to make women afraid of you when, when you're out there in front of the facility. You want them to know that you're there to help them, um, but you're not there to judge them. Because you don't want women to see you and then run into the abortion facility uh, seeking reprieve from you because they're so afraid of you. So you have to be approachable. Um, you know, whether you're praying or you're holding a sign, you're trying to talk to one. Remember, everything you do, you have to do with the utmost professionalism and respect for the woman, uh, trying to, see, you know, find out what's going on in her life that's brought her to the abortion facility. And um, counselors, do you have student counselors or adult? Both? Some of our students are counselors. It just depends on who, who, who is trained. Uh, we are in favor of anyone being a counselor, you know, outside of the abortion facility. Um, but like I said, we really do like to have young people out there praying because we know it, it strikes a chord with the girls walking into the abortion facility because they're the same age. Yeah. 
because uh, I was wondering, um, how do you train them to be counselors? I mean, what are they? There's many different trainings that, that are available across the United States. SFLA does training. Um, pro Life Action Ministries, uh, Action League down in Chicago does Iowa counselor training. Uh, and there's many different pro life speakers who travel the country doing training. And if your group wants to be trained in side counseling, you contact us anytime at yes. info at studentsforlife.org, and we can put you in touch with a local sidewalk counselor who can train you and your pro life group. Now, there was a comment that was made uh, several days ago on April 15th. Students for Life of America has launched a year long initiative called the Plan. Parenthood Project. What is that? Yes, this is our new project. We, we did a study last summer and we found that 59% of young people don't know that Planned Parenthood does abortions, but yet when they found out, they had a negative view of Planned Parenthood. And we know this is kind of Planned Parenthood's dirty little secret. Despite being a nation's abortion alliance, they don't really talk about abortion that much. You never really see in the media. When they send their reps to middle schools and high schools, to indoctrinate kids, they never talk about abortion because they know this generation really doesn't like abortion. They know there's something wrong with it. But that's really where they're making their profits. At 92%, according to their annual report, 92% of their services for pregnant women are abortion. They're an abortion industry. So what we're doing is going on campuses. We've got these bright pink crosses, uh, 915 to be exact. And each cross represents every baby that Planned Parenthood kills daily because of abortion. We kill 915 babies a day. And we feel like something like this is a good visual. People understand this isn't abortion to lie. This isn't a place where they simply give you free condoms and they're here for sex device. This is an abortion industry. And we also have panels and postcards where we take Planned Parenthood's own figures from the annual report, how much money they've grossed, how much money they've netted, how much money they've taken from taxpayer dollars, and really highlight their plan for young people. It's, you know, one, get into schools, say don't trust your parents, come to us. Waiting to have sex and turn married is impossible, so just come to us. And then they get girls, they get girls, you know, the lowest rent condos by consumer reports. They're giving them birth control, hormonal birth control, which is a type one carcinogen, the same as cigarettes. But they also know if she doesn't take it at the same time every day, it's not going to work. And then when she comes back pregnant, yeah. they offer her the abortion. That's bad. How many babies have been so far in the United States since Roe versus Wade? Do you know the exact amount or? Total part? from abortion, it's about 56 million. Oh, I know no. Planned Parenthood performed 333,000 abortions last year in America. A little more than a third of all the U.S. abortions, because the total abortions were about 1.2 last year. Well, that's not right. That is so not right. That is outright murder. Yep, yes it is. Well, we we have to forgive the the parents because they have been just you know, being lied to by Planned Parenthood and other people like Planned Parenthood calling the baby lump of flesh and they would not bother them after the abortion. I don't think that's right. I mean, um when will our generation come and finally know the truth? I know that we are reaching out to them. And even for the March for Life, there was a lot of students. More students than uh, uh, adults, I'm told? That's right. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Future goals for Students for Life of America, what are they? Excuse me, can you, can you restate that? What is this, what, what's your future goals for Students for Life sure. of America? Goals are, we have our immediate goal is we want to place a full-time regional coordinator in every region across the United States by 2016 because we know that's what works. Building personal relationships, going to campuses, finding pro-life students, training them in how to be an effective leader, that's how we've gotten this pro-life generation. That's why you always see the pro-life generation everywhere you go now. So our goal is to expand from four regional coordinators to 15 regional coordinators by 2016. It's a very ambitious goal, especially in a recession economy like this. Um, but we know this is the first step we have to take in abolishing abortion in this lifetime, it's mobilizing this generation. Now you'll be going to eight different campuses in eight states. So. Sure, yeah, this Planned Parenthood project, which is this weekend next, is going to eight campuses in eight different states. 
And this is kind of the pre-launch. The big launch is going to be in the fall when we're going to be going to at least 48 campuses in the first three months of the semester. Wow. So um, you're going to be talking about Planned Parenthood is re really about abortion and money. That's exactly right. Money, that's all they think of. They don't think of the babies or the mothers or the fathers. It's not, it's not, it's not fair. Uh, what else? Do you have anything else to talk about, my dear? Well, be before I go, I want to ask people's prayers. We're going to 26 medical schools this semester. We're in the middle of our Bed Students for Life tour, taking OBGYN, board certified physicians to medical schools, speaking the truth about abortion and conscience rights and natural family planning. And in most cases, it's the first time medical students have ever heard our message in all their years of education. It's a huge opportunity for us to really go to the belly of the beast because this is where the abortion industry has been targeting, is medical schools, because they need to train more abortions because they know there's not enough abortions, people willing to perform abortions out there. So we're going right to the heart of the battle of these medical schools. We ask for people's prayers and support. And if you want more information about all the stuff we're doing or to sign up our email alerts, you can go to studentsforlife.org. Studentsforlife.org. That's right. Um, I, you know, many thanks, Kristen, for phoning on to my TV show, Patty's Page. Once again, you have enlightened us and have shown Thanks, us Patty, for having me. and you have shown us what people feel are feeling now they're mm -hmm. more compassionate towards uh, unborn babies and their parents so i'd like That's to right. thank you for coming on to my show and i'd like to thank my guests and everyone who has come on to this show thank you god bless thank you bye bye dear well good afternoon to everyone it's so, uh, man, it's just so hot in here. It's just so hot in Indiana. Oh my goodness, I was like, why didn't I have my air conditioner on? I'm a faith woman, so I speak that by faith. Let me just say that I'm so grateful for Allen County and, and Kathy and uh, all of those wonderful. There we go, I got a whole lot of latitude now. <laughs> So grateful for everyone that uh, played a part in having me to uh, come here today. And I just really thank God anytime I have an opportunity to be used of him to share um, my own personal testimony. Because I believe that God uses that to encourage those who are part of life and standing for life and fighting the good fight of faith uh, during this time especially. You know, I thought about how I, when I come and, and I have to share and I have to give a speech, I'm always talking to the Lord. And I, ask him what he would have me to say and I write out a, a speech and I, some people give me a certain amount of time to speak in and, um, and so I always say, you know, okay, let me look at my notes and let me look at this speech beforehand and sometimes I'm tempted to read it and sometimes I don't read and just go back and forth but I always like to look at the speech right before I speak but then I told the Lord, I said, you know what, I'm not going to look at that speech I'm just going to trust you that whatever you would have me to say to the people today that that's what I'll say well, it's a good thing I said that because I can't find the speech. <laughs> so the Lord took that temptation away. God only knows where that speech is. But it was a good speech. <laughs> yeah, I was boasting to the Lord about how you know, I'm really going to trust you, you know. Well, I'm trusting him. You know, uh, we're getting ready to actually celebrate uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday on Monday. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I have a dream, too. You know, Martin Luther King wrote, he's famous. He was famous for his uh, I Have a Dream speech. And I just want to share briefly before I get into my testimony, because I've been here, been called here to share uh, Parnell's and my testimony. But I just want to share my, a brief part of my I Have a Dream speech. I think that it will probably go a little bit like yours. First of all, I have a dream that here in Allen County, here in Fort Wayne, that even though you've been coming here for 40 years, I have a dream that next year when you come here, we'll be celebrating the anniversary of the overturning of Roe vs. Wade. Can we serve a big God? I have a dream today. You know, I have a dream that when I come to a pro-life event as a black woman, that Paul and Cornell and I are not the only black folk to come out to a pro-life event and say, you know what, we stand for life. I have a dream today. Dr. Martin Luther King 
Maine led the march in Washington and, and he gave that I have a dream speech. I have a dream that as we march today, that we've got a great expectation that not only will preborn babies, not only will the preborn babies be given the inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not only I have a dream that no longer will preborn babies be judged by their size, their, uh, their place of residency, which is in their mother's womb, or whether they're planned or unplanned or wanted or unwanted by the mother or the father. I have a dream that the preborn babies are going to be loved and given dignity and given justice. Amen? I have a dream today. I have a dream that young people like Emma are going to begin to say, you know what? God's got a purpose for my life. I'm going to trust the grace of God to keep me from having sex until I'm married, but not only keep me from having sex until I'm married, but keep me from any activity that would hinder my purpose today. I have a dream today. <laughs> not only was Dr. Martin Luther King valuable, but when we think about Dr. Martin Luther King, it really helps me to realize how critically important every life is to the eternal plan that God has in this earth. You know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago this month, I was in a rally much like this in Louisville, Kentucky. Actually, it was in Frankfort, Kentucky. I was in a rally, and I went to that rally only to support my pastor. And so when I see so many pastors up here, it's so encouraging and, and encouraging, and it reminds me of my pastor. And let me, let me just, before I go any further, let me ask, who's my, who's my timekeeper? Because <laughs> Parnell can be my timekeeper. Parnell's going to be my timekeeper. If you have to just jump up and wave <laughs> to just to let me know. I think I've been given about 20 minutes, and all this was for free, okay? <laughs> my first part was free, right? Uh, <laughs> it's just a warm-up. But when I see the pastors up here, it reminds me, and I come to a rally like this, it reminds me that 10 years ago, almost to today, 10 years ago this month, our pastor invited the congregation to join him in Frankfurt at a rally to mark the infamous decision of Roe versus Wade. And I joined him at that rally simply because I love my pastor. I joined him because he had been a blessing to Parnell and me and our family, and I had a flexible schedule, and I said to myself, well, why not join him? But I certainly wasn't going to ride the church van with everybody, because you know how church folk can be. I'm like, no telling when we'll get back to Louisville. <laughs> They're going to lunch afterwards and all that. No, no, I have appointments. I was working in corporate America at the time. I said, that's not going to work. But, so I didn't ride with everybody, but I did go to support him. And I want you to know that it was in that very public place. It was in that very public place that, that God turned the light on. To something that I had done 22 years earlier. God turned the light on it and made me look at something that I had talked about since the day I did it. 22 years earlier, Parnell and I were at an abortion mill in Louisville, and I paid money for my first baby to be killed when I was 17 years old. We paid money for our first baby to be killed when we were 17. Parnell and I began to date when I was 15, and he was 17. We've actually been married for 28 years and been together for 33 years. <laughs> That's highly unusual, especially when you kill babies together. Statistically, women and men that have abortions together, the relationships do not work out. I believe it's God's plan because God has a purpose for our lives. So, I'm in Frankfurt at a rally, and the Lord speaks to me, and I just hear in my spirit, you paid money for two of your babies to be killed, and, and you have not asked me for forgiveness, and you need to repent. And I was really utterly shocked by that. And to, to realize the gravity of that and the, the power of that, you got to think, Parnell and I had never had a discussion about that, about going to pay money for our babies to be killed. We didn't even consider that as what we were actually doing. So for, for the Lord to speak to me that day, when I'm just going to support my pastor, that was a life-changing event. I began to pray and say, Lord, I mean, 
literally, I began to experience the grief of my babies being killed as if they were just killed right before my eyes that very day. If you can imagine being at the Capitol building at a rally and something like that happens to you, I began to pray and say, Lord, just let me get to the bathroom. Just let me get to the bathroom and just let me not lose my mind in this very public place. I asked the Lord to do that for me. By the grace of God, I got to the bathroom and I got down on my knees and I began to try to throw up. Because I realized, I, I mean, who does that? I paid money for, that's what I actually did? You mean, that's what I actually did that day? I thought I was just going to, to not be pregnant anymore. You know, as I stand here, you know, I'm putting my hands on my chest and thank God for the Holy Spirit because I feel my heart beating so fast because when you go to events like this and you, you, you're given an opportunity to share, you are reliving those events. The, God, the Lord gave me the strength to get back to Louisville. I met my pastor. I obviously did not stay for lunch. I met my pastor at the church. Thank God for a pastor that created such an environment, such a trust. I encourage you as a pastor, begin to talk about this issue from the pulpit and create a trust between you and your members that will allow them to feel like they can come to you when, you, when they recognize that they've done something so grave and so detestable and so despicable that their life is even on the line because if they don't let some, if somebody doesn't tell them, listen, you're going to be okay. God will forgive you. They will literally take their life. Thank God for a pastor that created that kind of trust environment. I made it back to Louisville. My pastor finally got back. And I shared with him something that I hadn't even talked to Parnell about after we had done this. I said, Pastor, I paid money for two of my babies to be killed. My pastor began to minister to me and say, Angie, not only did Jesus pay for your sins on the cross, not only did he shed his blood for you and for the, for the sins that you committed, but he also bore your griefs and carried your sorrows so that you don't have to. And I'm going to tell you something. It was very important that he shared that with me. And I imagine why he went there with those scriptures is because I was falling apart before this man's very eyes. I was devastated. And had he not said that, I'm sure that even though he let me know that Jesus paid for my sins and had forgiven me, I'm sure I would have taken my life. I could not believe what I had done. So when he said that to me, I said, Pastor, I don't want anything that God has done for me to be in vain. I just received that by faith right now. I didn't have a feeling with it. I just received it by faith. Because I've learned that we don't walk by feel. We walk by faith. Anybody that's ever endured something like that. Anybody that's done something so great that, you're so, that you, just, you just can't even believe you've done it. I want you to know forgiveness is available. And don't receive it by, by how you feel. Just receive it by faith. After that, he began to tell me. He said, Angie, I want to educate you on how abortion is affecting the community. Our country as a whole, but the African-American community in particular. He began to talk to me about how over 1,200 black babies are being killed on the altar of choice and abortion, on, on, on the altar of choice and inconvenience every day. He began to talk to me about how we are literally no longer the leading minority because we're not even replenishing ourselves. And you know, statistically right now in this country, 47% of the time black women are choosing abortion over giving the baby life. And he began to educate me, and so he said, Angie, we've got to do something. And I was so grateful for all God had done for me. I said, Pastor, I'm willing to do whatever God would have me to do. Now, what did I say that for? <laughs> I'm all emotional and grateful. He's like, well, what about going on the radio? I'm like, uh, I told this, I said this story earlier. Parnell and I, we love old Ralph Cramden movies, Honeymooners. And we, we know we love when Ralph Cramden says, hum da hum da hum da hum da hum da <laughs> Look that one on the radio. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I said, well, sure, I, you know, whatever God would have me to do. Within a week, within a week of that conversation, I was on the radio. Sharing something that I had not talked about for 22 years, that's the power of God. That's the mercy of God. That's the grace of God. You see, when God opened my eyes, he wasn't just 
opening our eyes for Angela. He wasn't just opening Parnell's eyes for Parnell. He was opening our eyes for all the many women that were connected with that decision that day. I'm telling you, hundreds, probably thousands of women, their lives have been saved. We know just through our sidewalk counseling alone, because I do sidewalk counseling in Louisville, Kentucky, and the ministry that we, uh, the Lord birthed through my own personal experience as Sisters for Life. And through that, we know that over 410 women have made a decision to keep their babies as opposed to kill their babies because God sent me to a sidewalk and said, Angie, begin to tell your story. Come out of the darkness into the light and let somebody know there's help. That God has a plan and he's got a purpose for their life and for their baby's life. So 410 women have been saved from abortion, 410 babies have life today, and not only that, think about all the families that are connected from that, and all the babies they're going to have. That's the faithfulness of God. I wish I could say that not only did Parnell and I pay money for two of our babies to be killed, but then we went on, we were in college, we went to college together, and I was pregnant for a third time, and as a result, I was going to use abortion once again as my form of birth control going back a little bit because I think this is so important for you to know that I can speak to every issue. I can speak to every area of this particular issue here. Parnell and I were going to kill our baby, our third baby, but somebody, somebody betrayed my confidence and told my father I was pregnant. I'd already had the money for the abortion. I borrowed it from the, the student services department at my university. So much for student services because nobody told me don't kill your baby. Being a college student like I was and being a lover of pizza, <laughs> I spent some of the money. <laughs> and Parnell was always looking at me, looking at me saying, has your father put any money in your account yet? And I'm like, has your father sent you any money this week? So basically, we both used the money. But I said, you know, I can borrow that money from somebody else. I went to borrow the money from someone who was a friend of my dad's. And they betrayed my confidence. They told my father I was pregnant. It's something to be said for betraying confidence when a life of the baby and the mother can be saved. Don't go so scary.